There we go. Thank you. Let's take our Bibles this morning and turn to the 20th chapter of John. John's Gospel, the 20th chapter. As you're sharing, as you're turning there this morning, I want to share with you some very important things in the life of our church. We've presented to our elders and then to the deacons as well. Our elders have approved and put together what we're calling a, a kind of a three-year plan for our church. Many of you have asked, you know, what direction are we heading in? And we're trying to follow the Lord's leadership in all that we do. And as I share these things with you this morning, it's all to be bathed in prayer. And that's going to be the key to anything that the Lord does is through the prayers of His people. So just a couple of things. This year we've looked at three different years. The first year, we will, some of these things have already begun to happen and we've implemented them. But we're encouraging every open door family to be involved in everyone working on one that you and your family would be praying for one family or maybe it's one person in your neighborhood that you would be praying for, leading them to Christ, first of all, to a relationship with the Lord, and then inviting them and encouraging them to be involved in the ministry here at Open Doors. So everyone working on one. Uh, you know, the world's going to change one person at a time, and that's our desire. Uh, in order to do that, we've encouraged this growth to come through our Sunday school. We've assigned... Each elder has two Sunday school classes that they will be supervising or uh, and praying for, encouraging. And along with the elder, there are two deacons in each Sunday school class. And they'll be encouraging the Sunday school classes to grow numerically and spiritually. And so the deacons have the Sunday school classes that they're praying for and going to be working with under the, again, the, alongside the leadership of the elders. So each Sunday school class is going to be looking and thinking about who can we pray for, who are the prospects in our area, and how can we begin to minister to these families. And so the desire there is to grow not just numerically, but to grow spiritually. And our deacons and elders are already involved in that, that plan as well. A part of that is to encourage fellowship in our church. We set up a schedule where each Sunday school class has a, uh, a, a regular place in the hospitality room. We've, we're seeing this happen already with Sunday school fellowships. I know our joy class had a fellowship last Sunday before church. Other classes have had luncheons already, and that's what we're encouraging our Sunday school ministries to do, to, to invite guests to come to be a part of these fellowships that are going to be going on on a regular basis. Once a quarter, every fifth Sunday, having fellowship Sundays. This would be a church-wide fellowship where we would have a covered dish lunch once a quarter, every fifth Sunday. The first would be May 31st. And so we're encouraging everyone to be working toward that May, uh, May 31st and inviting people to come. We've, decided, we've divided our families into a deacon family ministry plan. Every family has a deacon that is responsible for them. Every family has been assigned a deacon, and underneath the, the leadership of the deacon, we also have a, an elder. The elder is there for spiritual needs, and the deacon is there for physical needs. And so every family has assigned a deacon for physical needs and then an elder for spiritual needs. And so that's going to make our families hopefully more uh, feel more comfortable and more confident in what's going on and how we can minister to them. We've already established ministry teams and we're looking to establish other uh, initiative teams in the future, but ministry teams like member care and building grounds, all the things that have to be done to keep the church going, preparing the ordinances for the Lord's Supper, uh, prayer ministry, nursery. We've made assignments in those areas as well. But we'll be looking also for new areas of ministry. Uh, maybe like the social impact team we need to create, dealing with dis uh, issues like adoption or abortion. Uh, ministering to international students here on campus, how we can better minister to those who are here from other countries. Disaster relief. By the way, next Sunday morning, uh, Brother uh, Ed Smith, I think it's Ed Smith, it's in our bulletin anyway, he's going to be talking to us about disaster relief. Uh, he's going to come with Kirk Junkin. I remember Kirk's name. Uh, but they're going to be here talking to our men about the dis associational disaster relief team, how we can get involved in that. Uh, feeding the hungry. We've had an opportunity now to, uh, to, to work alongside First Community Church in the west side of town on Saturday mornings to feed people in, the, in that area of town on the west side who uh, it, was, it was a privilege really to go uh, with Brother 
Henry Horton, a young black man or an older black man. We just went from house to house in that area delivering meals, people who would use that food, not just for breakfast, but for that day. And so we want to be involved in community uh, outreach like that, feeding the hungry. The second year, looking more at who we are as a church and reevaluating our constitution and our covenant, church covenant, and making sure that every member understands the covenant here at Open Door Baptist Church. And what does that mean to me? What does a church covenant mean to me in terms of my involvement? What would it mean to me if, if I decided that I wanted to go somewhere else and I've made a covenant with, this, with the Open Door Baptist Church? How would that impact my life? So uh, those would be some issues we're looking at the second year, along with evaluating our mission focus. Uh, one of the things that we're going to begin to do immediately, we've you know, just kind of re revisited our children's church, and that's been expressed as a need. And again, ideally, we would like for our children to learn how to worship from their parents. We think that that's the place where they need to learn how to worship. But we also see a need for some of our younger children to have structure during this time. So uh, Heather Roach will be working with our children's church ages five years old through second grade. And you'll be hearing more about that in, in the next few weeks as well. Uh, Brother KJ will be preaching tonight, and he'll be sharing with us more about our long-range goals. But just want to kind of share with you, I, I realize one of the things that we have fallen down is just an area of communication. And we want to keep you informed of what's going on. And and where we're going and being, as I said, all of this is, is covered with prayer. And certainly we need to be praying for our church and praying for God's wisdom as we, um, as we face the future, as we move into the future. So thank you. Let's turn our attention this morning to God's word, the 20th chapter of John. You know, as we've studied the, the events of this gospel, we, we need to continually ask ourselves, what does this mean to me? What does the death of Christ mean to me? What does the resurrection of Christ mean to me? I put something in your bulletin this morning that a friend of mine emailed me. It's from J.C. Ryle. You know, when Jesus said in John 19, 30, when he said, it is finished, it is finished, the work was done. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 10 said, for the, for the one who has entered his rest has himself also rested from his works as God did his. So because Christ finished the work, there's a rest that is ours. The rest that Christ gives is an inward and spiritual thing. It is rest of heart, rest of conscience, rest of mind, rest of affection, rest of will. It is rest from a comfortable sense of sins being all forgiven and guilt all put away. It is rest from a solid hope of good things to come laid up beyond the reach of disease, death, and the grave. It is rest from the well-grounded feeling that the great business of life is settled. Do you have that kind of rest this morning? That it's all taken care of. Its great end is provided for, and that in time, all is well done. And in eternity, heaven will be our home. Praise God. Do you have that kind of rest in your soul this morning to know that all is well done? And that in the end, that in the end it is going to be great, that eternity in heaven will be our home? That's what Jesus meant when he said, it is finished. We can enter into the finished work of Christ. That's his death. How about his resurrection? Has the resurrection of Christ impacted your life? To know that Christ died for sin once for all. He took our place on the cross as he paid the penalty and payment for our sin. And now because of his resurrection, the power of God is available to us. And so we can identify certainly with his death, but we also must identify with his resurrection, that Christ is resurrected from the grave, that he is living, that he is a living Lord. Paul says, if we've been united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. What does that mean? It means that just the same power that raised Christ from the grave is the power in my life and your life to change our lives.